Hello and welcome. My name is Maria Heiler and I'm the Deputy Director of the Washington DC office and a senior researcher with the Learning Policy Institute. One of my roles there is to direct the Educator Preparation Laboratory. Ed Prep Lab is a partnership between Learning Policy Institute and Bank Street College of Education, Graduate School of Education. It is a growing network of teacher and leader preparation programs across the nation committed to transforming educator preparation through research, practice, and policy. While we wait a couple of minutes for more people to join, feel free to introduce yourselves down in the chat box by telling us your name, organization, and where you're from. See some folks from Georgia and California. Welcome from Mexico. See a colleague there joining us from the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. See someone joining us from Saudi Arabia. Welcome. A lot of New Yorkers and I see a Richmond, Virginia. Thank you for joining us today. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us uh, for this one hour sequel to our April 23rd webinar. If you're joining us for the first time, it's not necessary for you to have viewed the webinar um, from April 23rd, but we do encourage you to access that at your convenience. And as we begin, I'd like to thank our partner, the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education for their support with, their, for their support with this webinar. Um, we appreciate their partnership and the leadership of Lynn Gangon. I'd also let, like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded. A video recording will be emailed to you in a few days, so no need to take any screenshots or um, be taking notes furiously. We'll have some, that information for you in a few days. As I mentioned, today's webinar is a sequel to our April 23rd webinar entitled How Educator Preparation Programs Are Adapting During COVID-19. You can find the link in the chat box. We'll be continuing the conversations about how some of our Ed Prep Lab members are adapting during this pandemic. And again, while we will touch on issues of PK-12 teaching and learning, the focus of this webinar is um, on teacher and principal preparation specifically. We appreciate that our speakers who are national leaders in education educator preparation from across the United States agreed to come back and share more in depth about the work they're doing at this time, particularly as states and districts across the nation are starting to discuss what schools could look like in the fall as um, we start up schools again in September or August. We've organized this webinar in the same format as the first one with the bulk of the hour being a conversation amongst the panelists. We will also have two audience polls for you to take over the course of the webinar, and then we'll end with participant Q&A towards the end of the hour. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to engage in discussion, you may click the chat button and type in the chat box at the lower right side of your screen. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly introduce each of our distinguished panelists by name and title so we can jump right into discussion. Their bios are available through their institutional websites. First, we have Rebecca Chung, She's the director of the Principal Leadership Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. Anna Marie Francois is the director of Center X at the University of California, Los Angeles. We have Ira Litt with us today, who is, professor, who is associate professor and the director of the Stanford University Elementary Teacher Preparation Program. We also have Jennifer Robinson, who is a professor and the executive director of the Center of Pedagogy at Montclair State University. And finally, we have Kathy Schultz, who is Dean and Professor of Education in the School of Education at the University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you being here in the midst of unprecedented, unprecedented times. And I'd also like to thank the audience for attending. We know that everyone is incredibly busy during this time, and we're grateful that you took the time today to be with us. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to engage in discussion, you may click the chat button and type in the chat box at the lower right side of your screen. We want you to be as engaged as possible, so feel free to 
um, make comments or um, ask questions. So I'd like to start this um, webinar exactly the same way that we started the last one um, in April. I'd like to go around um, and have each of you just remind us about what values you're holding um, as a way to guide your decisions, um, what centers you and your colleagues as you have to make increasingly challenging decisions in this time, and um, this will give the um, audience members a chance to hear your voices and to hear your perspectives of what your values are in your institutions. So if we can go ahead, Anna Marie, can you get us started? And you're muted. Thank you. Um, thanks for having us back. It's so good to see you and our Ed Prep colleagues. Uh, so much has happened in the past month. So I think that my values have not shifted, but the ones I want to highlight today, given everything that's happened in the last month, is social justice, the dignity and worth of individuals and the collective, and the centrality of relationships. And I think what's centering myself and my colleagues across the state are the humanity within ourselves, the humanity of our students, the humanity of our colleagues, especially teachers and leaders um, in K-12 and ECE settings, because they are the ones on the front line, and the humanities of the families and the communities we serve. Thank you, Anna Marie. And I appreciate you being on mute because it wouldn't be a Zoom webinar without someone being on mute. <laughs> Ira, can you share with us the values that you're holding close? Sure. Uh, thanks, Maria, and thanks to um, everybody for joining us, and thanks to our hosts for welcoming us um, this afternoon. Uh, some of the values that I'm um, holding on to tightly at the moment include uh, community, relationships, uh, equity, access, and inclusion, uh, professionalism, and a very healthy dose of humility. Mm. Indeed, I think we all need to be holding that. Jennifer, what about you and your colleagues at Montclair? Sure. I'll build on what Ira said, humility for sure. Um, I think that um, we haven't really changed anything about our mission, which is um, making sure that our students, both our students as well as the students that they work with, to all of the resources that they need, um, Certainly, I think promoting um, pro promoting a, 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 an environment, a, a culture that is equitable, um, that really promotes the democratic values that we hope our, our teachers will take into their classrooms, and then um, their students will learn as well. Um, I think it's important that we definitely are focusing on nurturing uh, nurturing our teachers, nurturing each other. Uh, that's a big thing within our college, and we've done a lot to help uh, build each other up, as well as we're hoping that spills over to our students and then their students as well. And, um, and I think also leadership, um, helping our students understand that um, as they um, step up um, and recognize that they are essential workers um, in the midst of all of this as well, I think is, is important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Kathy? Um, so I could ditto what everybody said. As an educator preparation program, we practice and teach pedagogy that acknowledges and lifts up the humanity of leaders, teachers, students, and families. We center compassion in our interactions and decisions, and we teach and work with a focus on kindness, dignity, and as many people have said, deep humility. Yeah. I love the um, echoing of humanity. And Rebecca, can you send us off? Sure. We continue to be inspired by the words of Director and Professor John Powell of the Othering Belonging Institute. First, thinking and acknowledging the two opposing narratives in our country right now, one of othering and the other of belonging and specifically how social distancing and social isolation can lead to a lack of solidarity and how we continue to practice social solidarity during spatial separation. In other words, how do we not hold, uh, how do we continue to hold in the center 
essential workers? How do we continue to hold in the center those who are um, helping us to combat this pandemic while we are isolated in our homes, when we can't see them, and how we continue to practice holding our community together? Thank you. Um, what I appreciate about each of one of you and the words you shared, and I want to encourage your, um, our audience, if you don't know these programs, you should get to know them because the words that um, these folks are speaking really um, resonate throughout their programs and it's just not an individual speaking. Um, so I appreciate you sharing those thoughts and know that um, your programs are working in alignment with these values. So I'd like to turn to the audience and ask you a poll. And um, you'll have 30 seconds to respond to this poll. We're interested in knowing now that we're in this for a few months, especially those of you who directly teach courses in um, educator preparation, um, how prepared you're feeling to, develop, to de deliver online and virtual instruction, and in particular, what types of support you've been um, having from different places. So we're gonna launch that poll. And you have 30 seconds. And it's a choose all that um, apply to you. We appreciate that. Um, those of you who are still instructing online and know that it takes a lot of time and effort to do so in a quality manner. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about the thinking of that from our panelists. We'll give you a few more seconds. All right, and we'll go ahead and um, end the poll now, and we'll see what the results are. All right, it's good to see that at least 50% of institutions, institutions are um, represented here providing resources, and a lot of you all are just doing a lot of the work on your own. Um, Oh, and it's good to see the collaborative nature that we're seeing colleagues coming together and giving advice and support. So um, that's very informative. Thank you. And encouraging. We, we have a ways to go, but um, it's a good start. So thank you. Um, so back to our panelists. It's been about a month since we've talked. And um, we know that you've had new learnings in that time. I feel like every day is a new opportunity to learn something new in this space. Um, so I'd like to start with Jennifer and just ask what types of new understandings or practices, practices have you developed um, since this has all started um, in relation to educator preparation? Thank you. And I want to thank you again, Maria, for inviting me back uh, to have this conversation with some wonderful people from around the country. Um, so I, you know, I'm of a mind that uh, since we had our last conversation, really, really thinking more about some of the principles of uh, working with um, online and even working with our colleagues and um, as opposed to strategies per se or specific things that we're doing. Um, and I, you know, I wanna emphasize the fact that when we went remote, we didn't and we still don't have everything figured out neatly. And I think that that's true for everybody. Um, and so like one principle, which is creative group problem solving, um, that absolutely all of us have something to, um, to add to the conversation, um, that we, we ask our students to be flexible and to prepare their students to solve problems that we don't, we've never met before. And here we are in the midst of solving problems that we've never met before. And so I think um, really modeling that uh, for our students and recognizing that that's what we have to be about. And I think not giving it even a nod towards, uh, we've never done that before because um, yeah, we've never done that before and, and being open I think that's that's one real principle that we we've had to go deep on, and I think um, I think another thing is trying to emphasize the focus on our mutual work with our school partners and uh, focusing on the fact that they're P twelve students. I think Anna Marie, you said it best earlier that they're really at the focus and at the heart of this. Uh, their families, their communities, 
and on the populations that we're aiming to serve. Uh, and I think about the fact now that when I start meetings, really turning to our school partners who we are constantly trying to have at the table. Unfortunately, during the daytime, some of them are actually available. And so we capitalize on that and hearing from them from their perspective. And I think that really sets the tone for a lot of the, the discussions that we're having. Uh, for example, yesterday I was in a discussion uh, partnering our counseling department, our counselor, school counselor preparation department with the Office of Student Life in one of our partner districts and hearing from them some of the challenges for social emotional learning that they're trying to address and really, really hearing the empathy from our faculty not only the ones who were in the meeting, but even talking about including other faculty who have other strengths that, that can add to the conversation to help. Um, I think we had a really rich and deep discussion and our school partners were very open and honest about what they needed. Um, hearing our faculty talking about um, trauma check-ins um, as a model for how to go into a classroom, not only uh, in our, our courses, but again, into the classrooms that they're helping out with, our interns helping out with. And, and so, you know, I think focusing a lot more on why schooling in general, you know, why learning, and hopefully even getting us back to, you know, the curiosity, the desire for learning, the openness to learning has, has really come out of this, this situation um, because we've had to be a lot more creative. We've had to think on our feet and, and, um, and think creatively about ways that we're going to reach our students um, in, in ways that we've never thought of before. And, and I think coming together much, much more so than we ever could uh, in other times, um, because we have to communicate more. We, we have to be together. Uh, I just left a meeting a few minutes ago where we had uh, our faculty, uh, department chair, adjuncts, our school people, our clinical practice directors, all working together and, and director of our school university partnership talking about how are we going to do this work together, which we were doing before, yeah, yeah. but it's much, much more <laughs> high stakes now than it ever has been before and I think you know, learning how to be more respectful of each other. And again, that word humble with each other as well. So um, I'm glad that we're going to have this conversation and I'm going to try and make this more from my perspective, a conversation, because I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else on the panel has to say. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate um, the perspective. It made me think that we're, we're becoming the students and that we need to do all those things that we're telling them to do. And so the idea of modeling is so um, important when we talk about um, teacher and leader preparation for deeper learning and equity. Kathy, what, what's going on at um, CU Boulder? What are you all doing and what resonates with what you heard Jennifer talking about? Um, so a lot resonates always with what Jennifer talked about. So it's nice to follow her. Um, in the month since we talked last, we went from sort of the emergency phase of doing whatever we could because we had sort of been thrown into the remote format to really planfully thinking about next fall and how we will return to campus. Our campus is making the decision, has made the decision that we will have face-to-face -face classes, though the density of who's on campus will be reduced dramatically. And that's allowed us to have the opportunity to imagine and, and think about designing what we want our teacher preparation courses to look like. And so um, just this morning, I um, was in a conversation with all the deans talking about um, how the goal, you know, sort of given um, health and safety concerns, the goal will really be to have um, students spend about 50% of their time face to face and 50% of the time um, remote in some remote kind of format. And, and thinking about that in particular around teacher preparation, um, we've been um, worried about the idea that students, if K-12 schools are in um, 
are, are happening or actually face-to-face um, -face themselves. Um, what does it mean to have students fanning out to many different schools and then coming back to campus? Um, as we know that the social mixing that is what we want to avoid on campus as much as possible. And so what our um, teacher educators have been thinking about is spending the beginning part of the semester in face-to-face um, -face classes, perhaps outside. Um, we're lucky to be in Colorado where we can pretty much, unless there's snow, we can pretty much predict nice weather that we can be outside. But having the intensity of our face-to-face -face classes be at the very beginning of the semester. And then when students and if students can go into their classrooms, and this is particularly in the third and fourth year where they, students spend a lot of time in schools and in classrooms. When they're in the classrooms, then we, we will shift our, um, our time to remote um, learning. And that as we sort of calculate how much face-to-face -face time we have with the students, we can count the amount of time that they're actually in classrooms is part of our face-to-face -face time. And that's a time that our faculty will meet one-on-one -on -one with students in small groups of students, with students by school site, um, and as potentially a whole group in a, in a large Zoom format that we've all gotten so used to, um, synchronously and asynchronously. So it's, I think it's gotten us to think really creatively about the multiple modalities and also sort of the counting the time in classrooms in a different way and sort of in in concert with the the kind of time that we have in the university classroom um, we always talk about trying to bridge those experiences the field experiences and the classroom experience the university classroom experience and and i do think that this will um, help us do that we have a number of interesting challenges in our area because many of our districts um, don't allow videotaping. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have to be able to be creative in asking students to write and reflect and critically reflect on their experiences in order to bring them alive back to their supervisors or back to their instructors, their professors. Um, one person I was talking to yesterday was, one instructor I was talking to yesterday was saying that she plans to meet with her students outside of the school. She doesn't want to go in the school because if she visited inside every school, she would be the vector that we're all worrying about. But she's happy to meet with them outside of the schools and gather together. And that's really in response to the students saying, you know, it's important to us that you see physically see our schools. And so like Jennifer, we're really listening very carefully to our students. We're listening very carefully to the schools, people at the school site, talking to the superintendents, talking to the um, supervisors, talking to the classroom teachers, talking to the prospective students and the current students themselves to both allay people's fears, acknowledge people's fears, and begin to design experiences that feel safe and comfortable, but importantly, educative for everyone. And, and again, like Jennifer is saying, I think, you know, these are tough times and there's so much we can learn and about teaching and learning and about our lives as human beings by, you know, centering humanity in everything that we do. I really appreciate, um, you know, it's interesting because we are always, we, in the past, we've been so focused on teaching and learning and how do we do um, deeper learning teacher and leader preparation. And now we have to think about the physical safety and health of our students. And I think what you just said really highlights the balance between thinking about that, but still um, being committed to that um, high quality instruction. Uh, speaking of high quality instruction, Rebecca, I know that you all have to had, had to do some major um, shifting in some of your, the work that you're doing. So if you wanted to share about that, that would be great. Sure. So I'm going to pull on this um, theme that is emerging around collaboration and take you into um, this last month and how we had to intensely collaborate to um, redesign on the um, within three weeks a major performance assessment that we have inside of our program. So just a little background first. Um, 
our program, the Principal Leadership Institute, has had a, has had a long history of using per, a formative performance assessment. So I, I want to distinguish it from, you know, summative or external assessments like the EdTPA or the an administrator performance assessment. These are all within our program, and we use them as mile markers for students. And some of them sound like they have different names. We don't call them performance assessment, but for example, oral exams or a portfolio presentation, a mock expulsion hearing or a mock interview. Um, in the last month, we had our Spring Assessment Center. Now, Spring Assessment Center is the three-quarter mark of the program. It, it literally demarcates for students how they're doing and how much they're learning, tells our program where students still need to go before completion. And this day, which is seven hours long on a Saturday in any other year, Include students dressing up in their professional gear and spending the day emulating the life of a leader, what they want to do in the future. So you can imagine there's a lot of running around the building. You go to this room, you go to that room. The schedule is impossible because that's the life of a leader. You have to go to this appointment, you have to go to that appointment, you have to get some collaborative work done. You have to have individual work. We just really try to, um, to emulate that process so that they can practice. And so um, this is also an event that includes all the instructors that teach in the spring uh, semester. It's actually a culminating assessment of the content of the spring uh, semester. And it involves all of our leadership coaches who work individually with um, our students in the field. So this is a large gathering. And it's really a moment where we all come together and celebrate the learning that has occurred. So, a typical spring assessment center would have a case study that's presented in advance with pre-work and then they would come in ready for an initial conversation about the case which situates the day's activities then and we would observe them in um, while they do that and then there might be some time for the work group to work collaboratively so our, our students are organized into work groups to work on the tasks of the day the leadership tasks that are often on a leader's um, plate, like designing interview protocols, designing a professional development plan, etc. And then also they would have to give a presentation at the end of what they were able to accomplish and develop. And then finally, we did have we do have an individualized part around an, a practice exam for the orals. So we do something called a mock oral exam where students get to practice. So now imagine the amount of collaboration it took in three weeks to take that whole seven hour experience and turn it into a virtual experience. And we did it. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good. And I think that was because of the amount of collaboration we did. Examples of that collaboration started way before Assessment Center. We started observing each other's video classrooms. Anytime anyone was doing anything performance-like in their classroom, a bunch of us would go in there and just observe and debrief and talk about what we learned from that process. And that informed our design, this kind of iteration, quick cycles of iteration. And so in the end, what we did was we actually, um, we actually extended the pre-work to be more. We actually had, uh, we gave the case out as we always do in advance. And we asked each of the work groups to schedule their own initial conversations about the case separate from the day. And then we asked them to record themselves in a two minute video recording of the three priorities they felt that the principal needed to work on in this case. This is a case where you're a new principal at a school and there's a lot of data, and et cetera. And so all of the instructors and the field um, supervisors, the coaches, we were able to watch those videos in advance because they were actually preloaded several days in advance of assessment center. And so we had a sense of where people were starting. This allowed us to shorten the synchronous part because seven hours of synchronous activity, I don't need to tell you, is not going to work. And so what we did was we shortened it to only focus on um, a couple of activities. The other thing that we did though, in terms of the schedule was typically in assessment center, when it's in person, we stagger, the we, we stagger and rotate the activities, meaning two groups might be engaged in the mock oral while two groups are engaged in a discussion. And now this time, because of the synchronous environment, everything was done at the same time, meaning everyone first did their mock orals 
the individual part and they practice that part. Then we went to work group time for students to work on their assignments. We gave them some collaborative time and then instructors and coaches had time to talk about what they saw in the oral exams, who still needs help, who needs follow-ups, et cetera. What patterns did we see? And then we came back and we went to breakout rooms for presentation. So everything happens simultaneously, where in the past, the schedule would have been more complicated. Mm -hmm. And then we ended the day as we always do with appreciations. No champagne and apple cider this year, but at least we were able to come together and celebrate each other's growth. And it was really quite a tremendous day. So I would just wanna say the collaboration has been really important. It's been intense, but we can do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I, I love this thread of collaboration and I want to highlight that um, the, all the programs here um, for the audience have engaged in really deep collabor collaboration and have structures in place for that. So if that's not what your institution looks like, it's a great time now to start to develop those relationships and structures um, because it's been key, I think, in the institutions that I've had the opportunity to talk to, it's been key collaboration to the success of the work that they're doing. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit to um, collaboration with families and communities, because I know at the last webinar, that was a real deep question and a lot of people had um, wonderings about how folks are doing that. So um, I'd like to turn and um, ask Ira, what are you doing and how are you um, engaging um, your candidates with families and communities at this time? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Maria. Um, maybe, um, actually, this is important for thinking about the work that we do with families and communities. I want to take a minute and just acknowledge um, the essential fact that all of us and all the folks we work with, all the educators, all of our students, families, communities, we're all living through an extended crisis and a deep and complicated one. Um, it doesn't diminish um, the moment that we need to rise to this occasion, do deep and meaningful work. We're all um, attempting to do that, but we need to hold true to the fact that everybody is living through crisis. And I think um, if, we leave, if we can keep that fact on the table, it will help us uh, to ensure that we do right by one another and those that we aim to serve. Uh, so I just wanna take a moment. Um, and that's especially true as we're thinking about the work that we're doing with families and communities. We have to acknowledge the experiences, the surreal and challenging and complicated experiences that families and community members and educators writ large um, are living through and trying to work through. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a moment to focus on some of the um, clinical and cl community experiences that our teacher candidates are experiencing at the moment. Um, I think we've always framed and thought of our teacher candidates um, as essential partners in the work of care and community work and education um, with our school partners. Um, I actually think in a lot of ways, this particular moment has really elevated um, that fact. Um, and um, brought some clarity to the essentialness of that partnership. Um, we get lots of uh, regular feedback from our school partners, from principals, from uh, mentor teachers, from um, district leaders that um, our teacher candidates are essential in this moment. Um, it's very, it would be very complicated for our schools to do the work in the ways they wanna do it uh, without that partnership. Um, uh, so, small things like, uh, maybe actually these aren't small things. Um, schools need to be in touch with every family. They can't do the work they're doing without knowing where families are, what they need, how we get in, uh, in touch with them, what are the resources that will allow them to be in communication. Um, that takes a lot of person power um, and also relationship uh, capacity. And so our teacher candidates have been um, really important members of the team from the schools to reach out uh, to folks in the community to figure out where families are, what are their challenges, what are their stress points, what do they need for basic contact and communication. Um, that's dovetailed rather nicely with um, a course that I teach um, year-round for our teacher candidates. Um, and in the spring, we typically focus on building positive collaborative relationships with families. Um, given all the work our candidates are currently doing with families, it's actually made it even more real and authentic and meaningful. Uh, in a traditional year, we have to work a little bit harder actually to find access points and touch points for our teacher candidates to be in conversation in extended and meaningful ways with families. Whereas now that's really a core part of their work. Um, so it allows us 
to take the framing that we do to offer some of the knowledge base around building positive, productive relationships with families, thinking about an assets-based approach, um, thinking about the funds of knowledge that um, family members and communities have to offer, uh, thinking about the strategies for building positive, productive relationships. So it's a real partnership between families, um, educators, and schools, um, and helping to elevate educational opportunities for youth. Um, all of that work um, and the way that we do the work has some real deep resonance because it's in the moment right now. Our mm -hmm. candidates are in fairly regular touch um, with families. And in fact, this is true uh, in particular for our elementary candidates. They can't do any educational work without also engaging the family members because this is a real partnership. Um, family members are on the calls, whether it's a regular phone call or a Zoom call or FaceTime. Um, so uh, it also helps our candidates to appreciate the, the, um, the essential nature um, of this uh, meaningful partnership. Um, I could go on about some of the strategies and resources that we're using if that's helpful, but I actually thought I'd take my last minute. I actually wanted to um, uh, take the opportunity to bring uh, one of my teacher candidates into the conversation for a moment. So I have a really brief email that I got just two days ago from one of my teacher candidates that's really relevant to this um, conversation. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to do a quick read aloud um, uh, and share um, a short email from uh, one of my uh, uh, candidates. Uh, so it says, hi, Ira. I hope you're doing well. I just had a long Zoom meeting with a mother who's had a really hard time connecting with us because of time constraints um, and challenges with internet access. She only speaks Spanish, so I use my high school Spanish and Google Translate to communicate. Um, unfortunately, her son wasn't home because he was spending time with grandma, but I had a wonderful conversation with the mother. It made me extra appreciative of our role playing and rehearsals that we're doing uh, in our seminar course. I started by really checking in with her and asking about things other than schoolwork. Um, at one point she said in Span I said to her in Spanish, the most important thing that you're all is that you're all healthy and doing okay right now. And I wanna be supportive of that. If we're able to get some, some schoolwork done together, that would be a nice bonus. And I'm happy to help with that as well. So I shared my screen with her. I went over how to do an addition and subtraction problem so she could help her son use the workbook that we sent home. I also told her how and when I could meet her son over Zoom so we could do some more collaborative work together. At the end of the conversation, she was so happy that we were both almost in tears. Mm -hmm. It was her first time to really be in contact with anybody online because I had sent her step-by-step -step pictures of how to join a Zoom meeting, which she didn't know how to do. So as I'm writing this email, I'm feeling very proud and happy and feeling a, a little more ready for family interactions uh, for the coming year. So anyway, I wanted to um, offer that as a, um, a reminder about those that we're serving and the work that they're doing to serve others. Um, and also just to share how ridiculously proud I am of all of our teacher candidates and all of yours. Um, I think uh, given the current moment and all of its challenges, I'm so deeply hopeful about the future that they're going to bring to us with their level of commitment. Um, their deep concern for issues of equity, access, and inclusion. Um, the future they're going to bring for us, for our profession, and for those they serve is really bright. Mm -hmm. And I'm incredibly hopeful to talk to educators like you all because um, it's the intentional preparation of the candidates for that type of in interaction. That doesn't just happen. All of that theory you were talking about and the ways in which you prepare the funds of knowledge, the asset-based perspective, all that is necessary, especially when you have candidates that are so different from the students that they serve. So I'm just deeply grateful for the work that you all are doing to be able to prepare um, teachers who can have those kinds of interactions and leaders. Um, and I know that you're doing the same, Anna Marie, um, with the Center Act and um, your candidates. So could you share a little bit about um, what you're doing and how that looks like? Sure, but first I just wanna thank Ira, I thank everybody on this webinar and all the participants were so encouraged by that email. So thank you for taking time to share it with us. Um, one of the, the things I wanna pick up that Ira talked about is about this moment and how this moment is ripe for how we rethink parent and community engagement and teacher preparation. And I would add that that moment includes a new positionality for parents and teachers and leaders in that relationship to support K-12 students. I think in the moment of the pandemic, there is increased 
empathy across that, those labels. There's increased appreciation across those labels. And there is a willingness to collaborate in ways that I don't think that we have seen in the past. Because let's be honest, so we're all teacher educators, most of us are. The one area of teacher development that we haven't really done very well, and I don't think the field beyond um, teacher preparation does well, is figure out how to involve and engage schools and parents and families and communities in really authentic, reciprocal, powerful ways. And this pandemic and everything involved in it is pushing us to do that. So I'm really appreciative of the fact that this is an equity issue that is being addressed out of necessity right now. So, you know, traditionally, traditional forms of parent involvement and engagement really positions parents as either learners or in service of schools and classrooms. And so at UCLA, we're really, we have really been attempting to disrupt that view of parent school interactions and to create a really new paradigm that's more about authenticity, it's about reciprocity, being co conscious of the humanity of ourselves and others. And that also really privileges our individual and collective knowledge, skills, and power beyond the labels that come with and, and, and the meanings behind that label when you start dissecting people into you're just a parent, you're just a teacher, you're just a student teacher, you're just a teacher educator. And so in our teacher education program, we really believe, like all of our um, colleagues on the call, that one of our primary responsibilities is to help our candidates build positive relationships and fam with families and communities and offer them multiple opportunities for involvement, engagement, and also solidarity building. And I think that's what this moment is helping us to do and I'm really excited about that. So before the pandemic, we have a, we've long had a signature series of courses that build on one another. The first of the series is about an ethnographic study into the community. So getting to know the community, people that live there, their, their, their assets, their needs, their desires. And then we move into the second quarter with something more about identity and how do your, how do your social identities affect how you see communities, how you see parents, how you see the power of education. And then the last part of that series is a course that we call working with parents and families. And in that, course, candidates create, learn about creating and nurturing authentic relationships with families and building with parents and families to improve um, opportunities for, for young people. And as I mentioned in the last webinar, our teacher education program really does reach out to the other departments and units on the campus to help uh, to help bring expert knowledge that we may not have as teacher educators into our teacher education program. And so in this case, we have drawn upon the expertise of the Center X Parent Empowerment Project and local community-based organizations like Families at Schools um, to serve as not only guest lecturers, but to help us to refine the curriculum and to provide, provide su support for connecting us with schools. Um, and local parent group. Someone earlier in the introductions mentioned humility. I think Jennifer, you mentioned it. I think Rebecca mentioned it. When it comes to parent connecting our candidates with parents and communities, I think that's the first value we need to hold on to, is that we need to be humble enough to recognize the resources and the assets and the cultural wealth and capital that parents bring into the conversation around how we structure coursework, what the content is, and what kind of assignments would be evidence that candidates are ready to make that part of their practice. Um, so that's the course series, but then what happens when we have to take this virtual? Like all of us, we can easily move our courses online but something else happened at UCLA is that when you go virtual, you come together and you create something new that builds upon the best of what we, we what was. Because as I rem reminded us last time, there are things that we really do well 
And then there's opportunities to build on those things. So what I worry about is that people are scrambling to create things as opposed to reflecting on what you have and then enhancing them into this remote environment. So to that end, um, one of our, our most recent efforts um, that we actually launched tomorrow is called Conversations of the Soul, Conversations for the Soul, um, which is actually gonna take place on Facebook Live. And this effort is led by the CenterX Parent Empowerment Project in collaboration with the CenterX Culture and Equity Project. And Conversations for the Soul is gonna provide regular opportunities for parents to come together to have real conversations with one another about those school things that matter most to them. Um, to provide the parent audience with information, but also, and more importantly, to give them space and time to share the challenges that they experience engaging with schools, to help one another problem solve, because they have the answers. If they come together in coalition, they can create these answers for themselves. And then to launch a parent learning community that's ongoing and sustained. And what we have done is we've invited our teacher candidates and our mentor teachers, many of whom are parents themselves, to join as equal partners so that they can hear and learn from the voices of parents and community members and also lend theirs to the conversation without that power differential that happens across the two sectors, right? So this week's virtual gathering is titled Waiting to Exhale. And it asks the question, have you been holding your breath since the beginning of COVID-19. It's really gonna be a real conversation about parenting during the pandemic. And we have really high hopes that these conversations will impact, have an impact on the participant and provide insights that will deepen the discussions that our, candidate, our teacher candidates are having in their, in their 405 parent and family engagement course. And as they begin developing their teacher identity and make parents as invalu invaluable partners, part of how they see their, their identity and their practice moving forward. And that parents are resources for student learning and teacher development. Is and that a closed I, group? I'm sorry, Anna Marie, is that a closed group on Facebook Live? No, it's open to everyone. And okay. it's tomorrow night, it's at 6 p.m. Pacific time because okay. We want parents to be there and we know how busy parents are during the day. So it's an open group and it's going to be an ongoing thing. That's and I also great. want to make mention, um, I know my time is up, but this activity is really reflective of a statewide effort to really honor the voices of parents and take some of our lead as educators from, from them. So our state superintendent of public instruction actually last month had his very first parent support mm. circle. And it was intended to provide resources and emotional support for families. And I, I feel like our um, uh, Conversations for the Soul is a more localized effort that aligns with very nicely where the state is going. And then I also want to give a plug for, um, I don't know if you all read this probably isn't the right time, but I'm going to take advantage of my 30 seconds. Um, there was an 30 article, seconds. <laughs> there was an article in the medium yesterday, I believe it was called We Cannot Return to Campus This Fall. And it was written by a high school teacher in Oakland. And he really mm -hmm. kind of deconstructs all the challenges for opening in the fall. And I'm really excited to have conversation with our parent and uh, family communities about what are their concerns as their, fa as their children will be entering schools perhaps sooner than they might feel comfortable with. That's a great pivot actually. So thank you for taking the 30 seconds. And um, in the chat, they asked for the link if you have the link for the Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. I wanna take this chance to pivot back to the audience. Um, you know, we were just talking about planning and thinking ahead and so, we're curious for you all who are teacher and leader educators um, about your fall planning and what's going on in your institution. So we have a poll that we're gonna launch that is asking about how, um, how has your um, institution or how have your institutions been planning for fall scenarios? And we know that there's multiple scenarios that could um, occur. So we're gonna go ahead and launch that poll. 
and you have 30 seconds. Um, it's choose one, not all of them. And we know again, like we're planning for hybrid, some virtual, some in person. Um, you might have a be in a place where they're opening. Um, so we want to know if you're doing a lot of planning, some planning, a very little. And if you're unaware of your um, institution's fall planning, that's fine. We know some people are further away from the, um, the decision makers. We'll give you a couple more seconds and then we're gonna close the poll. And um, okay, we see some to a great extent, almost 50% to a great extent and some to some extent. And it's good to see that um, very few are not planning at all because um, we have to be prepared for a variety of um, scenarios come the fall. And I wanna um, take this time to shift to audience question and answers because um, we actually have a question about fall planning. Um, and so I wanted to um, get a, take a question from Pamela, Pamela who is the executive director of Summit Public Schools. Um, the question that she has is, how are you preparing to build community with newly enrolled candidates if they will enter your program in a virtual setting? Um, so wanted to see if any of y'all are thinking about that. You repeat that, Maria. How are you planning on building community with your newly enrolled candidates? And I know um, I've, I've been talking to some of your colleagues, Ira, you all have a week orientation usually that's like eight hours a day. Um, have you been talking about what that looks like? Yeah, let me, <clears throat> excuse me, let me offer a few quick thoughts. So I think for all of us, I mean, this is a time uh, where um, we're gonna have to be engaged in some real creative problem solving um, and uh, creative crafting. I mean, necessity will be the mother, mother of invention um, and we will build some things that are new and different, many of, what, of which I hope will be exciting and fruitful and valuable. All of the building and creative work that we're doing needs to be founded on uh, core principles, values, and aspirations. So we can't let go of the things that we know to be true and that drive our work. And so community always comes up for us in every conversation we have about how we're going to craft the work that we do, because it's so essential to the way that we do productive work and the way that we model it for our candidates to do in the schools and classrooms they're going to work. It's relational and it's community oriented. I can say for a fact that I am not, and nor did I'll speak for my colleagues, are we expert on building community from a distance, but I have a lot of confidence that it's feasible and possible. Um, we're tooling around with different possibilities this quarter, again, out of necessity. We've made some mistakes, we've had some successes. Uh, we will build a range of different kind of online orientation activities. Um, we've been talking about divvying up candidates and starting to get to know them from a distance in different kinds of ways so that they're you know full in their humanity to us as individuals before we launch in you know you know a hundred rectangles at a time um, so i think there's a lot of creative possibilities we just have to hold to the fundamental fact um, that community is essential and then that will drive us to do a range of creative work um, in formal and in informal spaces um, that help us get to the outcomes that we so desire. And that's related to another question from um, Barbara Burrington, the director at the University of Vermont, who's asking about, describe the new conversations and adaptations you are engaged in with schools and mentors about the fall semester and beyond. And I know, Jennifer, you started us off at that place, so I wanted to know if you had any reflections about that and if anybody wanted to jump in after you. Yeah, you know, I, I want to first of all uh, thank Kathy for the last time we were together talking about ways that we should really be focusing on what works. And I think that there are a lot of things that we could learn from this period right now uh, that's working. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're actually, because there aren't any ceremonies and there aren't any events that are going on, people are still available. Um, it's the end of the semester and we're conducting a series of focus groups. We started yesterday 
and we had two today and we're going to continue to have them with our mentors with our cooperating teachers with our school partners with our faculty our adjuncts our graduates as well um, just talking about what seemed to be really effective um, for them and we're and we're literally building we've been having a series of conversations almost since we had this webinar at last uh, with a lot of different constituents and stakeholders who are weighing in and um, one of the terms that I use and, and um, is 360 is hopefully getting a 360 perspective um, on what's happening on behalf of preparing new teachers and leaders so that we we're looking at all sides of this um, situation so in June we're going to um, wait, I'm holding a special teacher ed policy committee meeting or educator preparation policy committee where we're all going to come together a lot of faculty and, um, and again our school partners will be there as well and and arts and sciences as well arts and sciences our education our school um, uh, partners as well to consider the ways that um, looking at the data looking at what we've collected and beginning to shape out what we hope to do um, in the fall and that's that's one of the things that we're we're going to be doing again a, a previous conversation folks were talking about having a virtual orientation uh, that's going to happen cl closer in in august um, and bringing in people who um, have really been thinking about this and, and we're finding those experts so-called experts or individuals who who've had some success and to come in to talk to all of us um, further about you know ways that we can build community um, learn from each other and work together mm -hmm. I, if i can jump in i noticed in the chat a question about trauma-informed practices and i want to sort of use that to connect to this question to say that we have been using and thinking about how to use trauma-informed practices to connect um, not only as a group as jen has been talking about but individually with our student candidates with our master teachers with our principals and and um the superintendents and with people in our community and so in terms of trauma-informed practices that really starts with listening and eliciting feelings and fears and 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 people's um concerns about the time that we're li living in as we think about school placements next year and the kinds of work that we're pre both preparing students to do and supporting uh, our teacher candidates to do once they're in the in the schools and so i think you know really thinking hard not only on about how our prospective teachers and leaders need to um, think about how to address the trauma that's very real in the schools and potentially in their own lives, but how to use those practices that we know of starting with kindness and compassion and really just listening deeply to people to shape the relationships that will form the basis for the, the learning, the teaching and learning that happens in the fall. I think we will stop there because that brings us full circle right back to the values that we um, started with. And um, I'm just so hopeful, like I said earlier, and um, feel really uh, grateful for you all sharing because I think um, the threads of collaboration and humanity and um, just being thoughtful and intentional about the work you're doing is so important during this time. And it's a great opportunity, I think, for um, educator preparation to be really relevant and really um, useful in a way that hasn't um, always been the case. And the idea that um, we're really, you all are really centering K-12 partners and the needs of our students and schools um, is really powerful and I think is um, a way that we uh, need to continue forward past the pandemic and to continue to build on these practices that you have um, continued and innovated on. So um, I wanted to thank you all um, for sharing your knowledge and thinking during this time, especially coming back again. I, I feel like we could do this every month. <laughs> um, we'd also like to extend a thank you to our partner AACTE for co-sponsoring this webinar with us. Our partners and presenters have had some wonderful resources available on their websites as shown on these next couple slides. These resources are available on the web page shared in the chat box. 
A link to the recording of this webinar as well as to all the resources we share today will be sent to you via email. And finally, I'd like to mention that a survey will appear in your window when you leave this webinar and we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to um, give us your feedback. Thank you once again for joining us today and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.